the impact of external hip rotation, drawing, pushing on pelvic floor dysfunction and injury. I have no affiliations and I am self-funded. Birth-induced injuries to the fatty, perineal, ligamentous, muscular, fascial and neurovascular structures of the bony pelvis is considered inevitable. As in order to crown the head, the structures must stretch at ratios that exceed three times that which striated muscle can normally withstand without irreversible damage. Understanding the mechanisms of this stretch and damage is said to be critical for prevention and management, yet the mechanism still remains incompletely understood. My independent research and practice as a fistula surgeon and specialist in maternal trauma management suggests, however, the mechanism is due to modifiable aspects of birth that create unbalanced forces over small areas of maternal structures. One such practice is external rotation or ER of the mother's legs during the second stage. ER is commonly practiced worldwide by all levels of birth worker and takes varied forms as seen here. But in essence, it involves combining movement of the thigh anteriorly towards the trunk and laterally to the side away from the midline with external rotation of the thigh laterally around its longitudinal axis away from the midline while its anterior surface rose outwards. This original exploratory study hypothesizes that this practice of ER is potentially a significant cause of pelvic injury for several reasons. Firstly, ER impacts the size of the pelvic outlet. It has been demonstrated through an MRI study that combining abduction with ER decreases the interspinous and biosciatic diameter by 6.5 millimeters and 4.2 millimeters on average respectively. This results in the narrower lateral diameter of the lower and middle pelvis because the weight of the body of the femur is transmitted as posterior force to the acetabulum, which is formed mainly by the ischium. So posterior pressure on it externally rotates the iliac bone, such that the spines orient towards the interior of the pelvis and the anterior triangle of the perineum narrows. ER also reduces the posterior triangle as it prevents the movement of the sacred iliac joint, such that the sacrum cannot mutate or move backwards. Additionally, if the woman is supine, as may invariably be the case with ER, the movement of the sacrum is compromised further. This all results in an immobility of the pelvis and reduction in size of the bony outlet where the levator anine muscle originates and inserts. Now, this shape change of the outlet drawn ER may only be a few millimetres, but it is significant if one considers that it may potentially make the diameter of the muscle smaller and stiffer, predisposing it to injury. This is because its origin and insertion points on the pubis and coccyx are closer. So not only is the cross-sectional area of the muscle reduced, but it's also theoretically stiffer as its dynamic elasticity decreases. However, more significantly, this stiffness in the muscle may come about because the obturating internus muscle, shown here in pink, is a major external rotator of the leg. Its covering fascia has a linear thickening, shown here in white, called the arcus tendineus levator ani, um, or atla. Now, the iliococcygeus part of the muscle, shown in green, originates from the atla, and the arcus tendineus fascia, fascia pelvis, to which the pubococcygeus and ligament attach, run in series with the atla. So it's possible that contraction of the obturator internus drawn ER can create reciprocal tensioning in the fascia and by way of, way of attachment and line of pull influence the length tension of the muscle shortening and stiffening it. In my soft body physics simulations, higher stretch rates are created by ER causing the baby to be shifted from a reduced posterior triangle onto a smaller anterior triangle which is stiffer such that as it progresses, the baby needs to use greater force to overcome a tighter inelastic area. In simple physics terms then, high multidirectional forces occur over small anterior areas, and this causes enormous pressure downwards on vulnerable anterior structures and the anterior part of the posterior triangle, with immense stress localized around the region of the atla, the rectal and coccyx area, and the pubic area. Use of greater force would theoretically also be compounded by the muscle's reflex contraction in response to the force being exerted on it by the head. Add an extra stiffness such that it is unable to relax and withstand larger deformations without trauma. A vicious cycle then potentially ensues with pushing forces of the uterus insufficient to overcome the resistance of the stiff muscle such that the muscle must also voluntarily push, increasing intra-abdominal pressure which will also automatically contract the pelvic floor. These internal forces generated by the muscle then potentially transmit mechanical signals throughout the cytoskeleton of the cells of the muscle fibers, causing remodeling that affects proliferation 
apoptosis, and other functions. This intriguing hypothesis of high force over small areas created by stiffness caused by ER is supported by evidence from numerous finite element models of the second stage, which show high stretch rates as outlined in the references. For instance, bones are often limited by boundary conditions, modelled as a rigid body limited to move only in the inferior and lateral direction, as hypothesized in ER. In addition, in some studies, the muscle is modelled as hypoviscoelastic, which adds a stiffness component. There's usually a large degree of stretch in the inferior direction, with the highest stretch found in the posterior medial region. And reduced muscle circumference is found to increase stretch. The maximum stress distribution is localised around the atla, such that increasing stiffness of the lateral attachments increase stretch, and when stiffness is decreased fivefold, it results in a 14% decrease in stretch. And great stress around the atla is found to correlate in some finite element models with not just increasing stretch, but also the maximum degree of damage. Further support for the ER hypothesis comes from this finite element study, which used statistical shape analysis to determine the muscle shapes more susceptible to childbirth-induced trauma in the MRI data of nilliparous females. The shape, which explains 45% of the total variation found, primarily described arms of the iliococcygeus decreased in length, with reduced circumference of the overall muscles, which potentially made the pelvic floor models require larger forces to accommodate the fetal head due to the increase in muscle resistance. As a result, there was an increased stretch ratio and potentially this led to a complete or partial detachment of the muscles. Strong support for ER comes from another finite element study based on axial multi-slice sequence MRI images taken of a live birth. Not only does it support the findings of previous models, but also that the woman was positioned with her legs in external rotation. The effects of this on the bony space can be seen in this MRI sequence of the birth with the baby not making use of the posterior triangle as seen by this gap here, theoretically because of external rotation, and being pushed anteriorly onto what we hypothesize is a smaller, stiffer outlet, molding its head in the process to try and fit through. Other studies in support of the significance of smaller, contracted and potentially stiff muscles created theoretically by ER comes from studies which have correlated a longer second stage with the evidence of trauma, such as muscle avulsion. For instance, an ultrasound study showed a longer second stage was associated with a shorter AP diameter of the levator hiatus. Another ultrasound study showed that a longer second stage and smaller muscle circumference was found in women who tended to coactivate or clench their muscles during pushing. On questioning, an author of the study stated that the woman pushed with their legs in external rotation. <clears throat> Another study using elastography revealed high pelvic stiffness scores postnatally were associated with a prolonged second stage of labour requiring forceps and MRI evidence of muscle avulsion defects. This exploratory research suggests that avoiding ER in the second stage is a low-cost, simple change to practice which can potentially have a huge impact on the prevention of a plethora of mechanical trauma to the pelvic floor. I conclude that until we can carry out urgent research into the impact of fire rotation on the pelvic floor, we leave women's legs alone where possible in the second stage and allow her to move them freely. Thank you.